want proof that Jesus is a universalist. I've heard it said that Jesus didn't teach universalism, and that's a fair criticism. Why doesn't Jesus explicitly teach universalism if universal restoration is true? What I'm about to show you might come as a surprise, but Jesus didn't need to teach universalism. Rather, Jesus openly assumes universalism in his teachings and even makes an open proclamation of this as well. This is because the overwhelming expectation of the first century Jewish people was that the Messiah is coming to restore all creation and bring all peoples and nations to God in worship. Let's start by looking at some Old Testament prophecies and in a moment, we'll look at this in context with the teachings of Christ. All nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They shall glorify your name. God, give the king your justice, your righteousness to the royal son. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor who has no helper. His name endures forever. I have sworn by my own name, I have spoken the truth, and will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of nations will bow down before him, for royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. The Sovereign Lord will show His justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise Him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring, with plants springing up everywhere. And notice that the Apostle Paul's words also echo this same understanding. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so he could have mercy on everyone. That the Messiah would fulfill these prophecies was simply the overwhelming expectation of the first century Jewish people. The prophesied Messiah was not expected to be a partial savior of the world, nor any kind of ordinary king at all. Rather, the Messiah is expected to be a timeless king endowed with divine power and authority. We read, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7 Interestingly, Jesus' most common self-identification, not in the pop culture sense, was that he is the Son of Man, referring to this very prophecy in the book of Daniel. It is perfectly rational to believe that the risen Christ is this divine king exactly as he claimed to be, and that he is now seated at the right hand of power, transforming this fallen world as I speak. Now let's move on to the words of Jesus himself. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling, and those who do iniquity, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13. Now the furnace of fire, taken literally, sounds absolutely terrifying. So you might be asking, how in the world could Jesus be assuming universal restoration by saying such a terrifying thing? Well, again, this concept of the furnace of fire also comes from the Old Testament. Jesus wasn't inventing anything new here. We read, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be to him a people of inheritance as it is today. Deuteronomy chapter 4. For they are your people and your inheritance, which you brought out of Egypt from the middle of the iron furnace. 1 Kings chapter 8. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Isaiah 48. I will bring this third into the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. I will test them like gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, this is my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Zechariah chapter 13. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them as gold and silver. And they shall offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Malachi chapter 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord tests the hearts. Proverbs 17.3. In the book of Revelation, Jesus also echoes these words of refining of the hearts of men. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich. Of course, the riches Jesus is referring to are the rewards that come with a pure heart, refined like gold. Paul also echoes this Old Testament understanding. If any man's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved but as through fire. I've noticed that some translations incorrectly read that they're saved by escaping the flames in this passage. But that's not what Paul said. The Greek word dia means you're going through the fire. And the reason you're being restored is because of this fire, metaphorically speaking. So now when you see this passage where Jesus says he's going to throw people into the furnace of fire, you know that this is an Old Testament metaphor of restoration. Jesus is assuming universal restoration when he talks about throwing people into the furnace of fire. Moving on, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are those who enter in by it. How in the world does the wide gate that leads to destruction refer to restoration? In this saying, Jesus is using a word picture of the new Jerusalem, the gateway into the kingdom of God. Jesus warns us to enter by the narrow gate, for many enter through the wide gate of their own destruction, but they do enter in. Just as the prophet Ezekiel tells us, even the utterly destroyed wicked people of Sodom are restored by God. But someday I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and Samaria, and I will restore you also. Ezekiel chapter 16. It isn't difficult to enter through the narrow gate. It's sacrificial. Your camel and earthly goods are not coming with you. You're going to have to lighten your load and leave it all behind for Christ's sake to enter through the narrow gate. The rest of mankind will enter in through the wide gate of their own destruction. And like it or not, you're leaving it all behind anyway the hard way. But they do enter in. Again, Jesus is assuming universal restoration in this teaching. Moving on, Jesus, speaking to the religious leaders of his day, said, Most certainly I tell you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. When you saw it, you didn't even repent afterwards that you might believe him. So the elephant in the room here is that these corrupt, Christ-rejecting religious leaders, also referred to as a den of vipers, are going to eventually enter the kingdom of God. Rather, tax collectors and prostitutes are going to get there before them. And yes, these religious leaders enter through the broad road of their own destruction. In case you have any doubt, the parable of the tenants talking about them ends like this. When therefore the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? They told him, he will miserably destroy those miserable men and will lease out the vineyard to other farmers who will give him the fruit in its season. Matthew chapter 21. So these religious leaders do arrive in the kingdom of God, albeit after tax collectors and prostitutes, they arrive through the wide gate of their own destruction. But they do arrive. Jesus is assuming universalism in these teachings. Moving on, Jesus said, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. When the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With men this is impossible. With God all things are possible. So Christ has given us a situation here where it is clearly impossible for salvation to happen, and responds by saying, with God, all things are possible. It would be absurd for Christ to say this unless he meant God will actually do this. The assumption is that God can, and therefore will, save even the hopelessly lost, because he can. 
Jesus is assuming universalism in these teachings. Moving on, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I would have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me from now on until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23. Again, the elephant in the room here is that eventually they will see the Lord again, but not until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, Jesus is overwhelmingly assuming universal restoration in these passages. Moving on, he says, Before him all the nations will be gathered, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Matthew chapter 25. Again, in this case of the sheep separated from the goats, Jesus is assuming universal restoration. Contrary to popular myth and superstition surrounding this passage, to be at the right or left hand of the king, both are a place of honor. We read, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came near him. They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. So James and John, they understand that sitting at either the right or the left hand of the king is a place of honor. Also, I've pointed out in the past that contrary to popular myth and superstition, goats are not worthless evil animals to be sent into the flames forever. They are in fact very useful and valuable animals. If you're a herdsman, you would know the difference between the sheep and the goats. The sheep naturally listen to the herdsmen, but the goats have to be disciplined by the herdsmen first. Otherwise, they will wander off and get picked off by predators. They're just more difficult to deal with. So, the goats ultimately arriving at the left hand of Christ is actually a place of honor and a proclamation of their eventual restoration after their destruction and disciplinary correction. Jesus is very clearly assuming universal restoration in these passages. And not only that, the restored eventually arrive at a place of honor at the left hand of the king. Matthew chapter 25 even concludes with what is in the Greek a very clear and definitive affirmation of this restoration via disciplinary correction. And these shall go away into age-abiding correction, collapses, but the righteous into age-abiding life, Matthew 25, 46, the Rotherham Bible. This passage, Matthew 25, 46, is commonly and yet falsely translated as they go away into eternal punishment. And this is considered a proof text for endless punishment, but that understanding only succeeds if you mistranslate the passage as is commonly done. Every translation that reads eternal punishment is without a doubt being taken from the Latin translations and not the original Greek. Every single Greek lexicon I can find agrees with Joseph Rotherham's translation. Every one of them. And in mentioning the Latin translations, I do want to be fair to St. Jerome here. When he translated this passage into Latin back in the 4th century, the primary meaning of the Latin word, eternal aternus, was of an age, lasting, enduring. Endless punishment wasn't being forced upon the reader in Latin. It was just a theological opinion. And Jerome actually didn't condemn universal restoration per se. Rather, he opposed the universal equality of the restored, such as prostitutes eventually being equal with the Virgin Mary in the kingdom to come. And I suspect that was a political and not a phil philosophical stance by Jerome in any sense. But that's where he stood. But back to Matthew 25, 46, translated as correction in the Rotherham Bible. It actually means corrective discipline. And astonishingly, every Greek lexicon agrees with Rotherham on this, and yet no commercial Bible translation has picked this up for some strange reason. Strong's Concordance, per primary, the primary definition is correction. The Thayer's Greek lexicon, the, the primary definition is correction. Thayer's lexicon also notes that Aristotle defined classes as corrective discipline as opposed to retribution to satisfy the punisher. In other words, Colossus is not retribution from God. It is for the purpose of correction, exactly as Joseph Rotherham translated it. Little Scott, a Greek English lexicon, provides that Colossus is akin to pruning back a tree. 
most especially an almond tree, um, and also that it is chastisement correction. Interestingly, um, the reason for pruning back an almond tree is to remove diseased branches and to allow more airflow and sunlight into the center of the tree to prevent disease and allow the fruit to ripen. Pruning is literally medicine for the tree. And it is such an important concept that we're missing in these popular commercial Bibles. The meaning of this word classes is it, it's literally medicine for the person undergoing this kind of correction. And curiously, uh, second century Greek church father Clement of Alexandria understood God's discipline as a kind of medicine. I don't know if he picked that up from the Greek word kalazis or not, but he wrote, God's justice is of itself nothing but goodness, for it rewards the virtuous with blessings and conduces to the improvement of the sinful. There are many evil affections which are to be cured only by suffering. Punishment is, in its operation, like medicine, it dissolves the hard heart, purges away the filth of uncleanness, and reduces the swellings of pride and haughtiness, thus restoring its subject to a sound and healthful state. It is not from hatred, therefore, that the Lord rebukes mankind. Clement of Alexandria, 2nd century. You know, so very clearly, the 2nd century church father Clement of Alexandria understood punishment in the New Testament as a kind of medicine given by God. It's interesting that the etymology of the Greek word kalazis is that the pruning back of a tree functions as a kind of medicine for the tree. And did Clement pick it up from that word? I don't know, but it's interesting that that meaning is in that word. But the main point that I'm making here is that Jesus clearly assumes universal restoration in his teachings. And it would seem that his first century Jewish audience was expecting this as well. And the examples I have given here very firmly establish this. It's if, if you want to try to refute that, you, you're welcome to try. But I think this very, very strongly shows Jesus assumes universal restoration. And I'm going to conclude with this one verse where Jesus actually is openly proclaiming universal restoration. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In this passage, Jesus isn't merely assuming universal restoration. He is proclaiming it loudly. In Koine Greek, this passage says that Jesus is literally dragging all of mankind as a conquering king who has overthrown a unjust ruler. Christ has conquered sin and death. He has already saved us. And he is in the process of restoring all of mankind right now as I speak in this great age of ages. But knowing this truth isn't enough. We have to walk through the narrow gate, heed the warning of our great Savior Jesus Christ, and enter through the narrow gate by submitting your life to him today. And in concluding this message, I would also like to exhort Christians to count our blessings. The early Christians would have been envious of the freedoms we have today at least here in the Western world, to share this extraordinarily good news. The Apostle Peter once said, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, which actually means fear nothing else, and honor the emperor. In other words, as believers, we are not rebels. We have been entrusted with the best news we could possibly share with this fallen world. I feel so blessed that I live in a time in a nation where I can shout it from the rooftops without fear of persecution from my government. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the whole world. Honor him and proclaim it loudly. God bless you and thank you for listening.